Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Welcome to Bad Sex and Other Problematic Analogies. Yeah! <laughs> I am Stephanie C. Curtison. This show is still kind of a work in progress. Uh, it's also a book in progress. It's all sorts of things. Uh, and it's a little bit stand-up-y, it's a little bit essay reading, and it's a little bit uh, cabaret-style songs that you may already know. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. People are strange when you're a stranger Faces look ugly when you're alone Women seem wicked when you're wanted Streets are uneven when you're down When you're straight Faces come out of the rain When you're straight No one remembers your name When you're straight When you're straight People are strange when you're a stranger. Faces look ugly when you're alone. Women seem wicked when you're unwanted. Streets are uneven when you're down, when you're strange. Faces come out of the rain when you're strange. No one remembers your name when you're strange. When you're strange. When you're strange People are strange When you're a stranger Faces look ugly When you're alone Women seem wicked When you're unwanted Streets are uneven When you're down When you're strange Faces come out of the rain When you're strange No one remembers your name is called Bad Sex and Other Problematic Analogies. Bad sex is in itself a problematic analogy. There are really three different meanings to bad sex that this show kind of brings up. So there's what bad sex should mean when you say bad sex, just like, I don't know, like I was there and they were there and it was like, ah, 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 what's this bad sex? Uh, that's what it should mean. Sometimes it's used as a problematic analogy when what we mean is non-consensual sex, bad sex, otherwise known as rape, assault, bad sex, that was not what I wanted, that was bad sex. That should never, ever, ever, ever be called bad sex. Then there's my favorite kind of bad sex, which is the kinky, like, bad sex. Bad sex. That one I'm okay with because it's like bad sex. I'm into it, you're into it, we're into it. Yeah. And it's so funny because I know a lot of the Tumblr crowd comes to Tableau, RIP. Oh, no. yeah. um, <laughs> and Tumblr was a huge inspiration for me as a like kinky queer person and figuring out what I'm looking for and what I'm interested in, and it's a little bit all over the place. Uh, Tumblr is a little bit all over the place, and then they told us that Nazis were okay, but sex workers weren't. Um, thank you. <laughs> Too soon. Uh, so, <laughs> still, nonetheless, Tumblr was a very safe space for many of us, and we discovered a lot of things about ourselves. Uh, and a lot of this show is what I like to call uh, therapy in art. So a lot of artists suffer from mental illness, and don't worry, I also go to therapy. Um, 
but my artwork is some bit of therapy uh, because I love to express all the things that I think are totally like just mine in my head and then I get to get up on a stage and share it with people and uh, it is the most rewarding part of being an artist to hear that you make somebody feel unalone. Woo! Um, thank you. <laughs> um, but with that being said, so Tumblr was a really nice place to kind of reach out and meet people without feeling like, okay, I don't, I, I don't want to like touch these people. I don't know anybody yet. Um, so when you want to keep to yourself and just learn about yourself, it was a, a great way to go about it. And I made friends with a gentleman who uh, would give me writing assignments. Oh. <laughs> I know, really? it was nice. Really? Really, really. <laughs> I had weekly homework, um, which I enjoyed as a writer and as, you know, like a sub like, oh, like, can you want to do that? Okay, you want homework? Okay. Um, so I have some of these pieces, and I'm going to share one with you this evening. <laughs> this is actually my first essay for Tumblr. I refer to it as Tumblr Dom Essay Number One. Remember Tumblr Doms? Ew. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also sometimes call it How Much Control. So the prompt, right, because there was a weekly prompt, was I want you to let me know in depth how strict you desire the control you give over to someone. How much control of your life do you desire to be in another person's hands? How does one measure this? How does one enumerate control? In every relationship, there is some sort of balance that must be maintained. If not an equal contribution, a comparable and complementary one. I've always been one to buck authority. <laughs> Ambitious and at times stubborn, I have never been afraid to speak my mind. I've never felt that I owed anyone anything. I don't like to owe anyone anything. I'm my own woman, my own person. I'm proud to be independent. Behind my big smile and coy eye, I have always thought myself to hide some vile thing. I'm wild, full of fire and rage. I have a million things to say and do. I have manifests to create. I have a world to conquer. My greatest enemy is my own mind. The angry, screaming thing in there paralyzes me with, it, with inaction. And what I lack in my life more than anything is discipline. In my determination to rule my own world, I tend to live in a state of chaos. Every responsibility in my mind flags itself as first priority. Every single thing demands my immediate attention. I want someone who can quiet that rage. My ideal partner would encourage me to be my best self, even when it is difficult or unpleasant. I need someone from whom I can learn. I want someone who can figure out which choices are genuinely slowing me down and offer to take them away. Someone who sees my potential and is pleased to watch me exert my power in places where it is more valuable. Yes. I want to be someone's absolute favorite. I want to be a priority. I want my gratification to be someone's responsibility. Someone patient but vigilant, strict but compassionate, my biggest fear is to be a bother. I want punishment only when necessary with clear communication on the why. I want praise for all my good doings and rewards when I am deemed deserving. I don't want to be a slave or a toy. I want to be a disciple, a protege. I need rules and tasks for when I'm on my own and unable to silence my mind. I'd like someone to take pleasure in my effort. I want them to let me know when I can expect to hear from them, to let me know what color lipstick or candies they want me to wear. This person would need to take my allegiance as something sacred and never take it for granted. I've always considered myself an artist. I write, I act, I sing, I draw, I paint, but my favorite medium of all is sex. 
My body is my favorite instrument. Yes. The ways it moves and trembles are only half as beautiful as the sounds it makes. It needs to be played by someone who can create the breadth of its capabilities. Someone unafraid to help tune and calibrate to perfection, all the while appreciating the care and precision required. Be my director, my audience, my critic, my biggest fan. Demand front row seats every night to the show that is me. Tell me how to make it better and revel in its ascendance. This person would know me and above all, allow me to know them. My performance in obedience can only be honed via total openness and communication from the one it aims to please. To wield it with wisdom and greatness is to revel in its glory. I create magic and my orgasm is my greatest source of power. Ours is a holy quest to summon divinity. This is the levity with which I must be taken. How much control do I want to give? I want to give nothing. my first forays into just light, light kinky play was with a good friend of mine named Sam. Sam is a friend of mine who is the most like me of any person that I've ever met in my life. But with the exception of I had always considered myself strictly a top and Sam was a hardcore bottom. So I had to ask, Sam, you are like me. You don't let people tell you what to do. Like you're your own woman, like snip snap. Like what is going, I have to understand. And she was the first person to really talk to me, even though I've heard someone say, of course, that like the sub is the one who's really in control. What Sam had said to me was, it is so relieving to let someone else be in charge. I make every decision day to day. I don't let anyone tell me where I'm supposed to be, how I'm supposed to get things done, but at the cost of never ever letting go. It is so amazing to find someone who makes me feel like I can let go. And I said, that does sound really incredible, but I don't want to get hit. And Sam was like, Stephanie, there's so much more to bottoming than getting hit. <laughs> and I was like, okay, like, we're gonna, like, what do you, like, what else kind of, like, what kind of stuff do you do? And Sam told me about sensory play. And she said, okay, like, let me get a few things. And if you're all right with it, I'm gonna blindfold you. And I said, okay, but don't fucking hit me. Sam was like, I'm not gonna fucking hit you, okay? Just put on the blindfold, calm down. So the two things that Sam used on me, one, I never get it right, the Warburton wheel, the little spiky, little Wartenberg wheel, someone said it, thank you so much. <laughs> the little spiky wheel, and I'm tingly and I'm jumpy. Uh, and then the next thing she used was sort of like that, it was the uh, vampire gloves. Yeah! So yeah, <laughs> yes. So if you're not familiar, which I feel like this crowd is, um, if you're not familiar, they're very soft and supple and gentle on one side and spiky and sharp on the other. So with a combination of being blindfolded and laying there and the anticipation of like, don't fucking hit me, uh, <laughs> Sam would very gently glide and of course as soon as I would start to relax, turn and turn the spikes into my stomach. Never hard enough, of course, to puncture the skin or to really hurt me, just enough to make me gasp. <laughs> so then I became obsessed with the idea of being taken over. But not in a way, of course, that was like against my will, but in a way of like being consumed. Yeah. <laughs> So then I wrote this next piece, which uh, 
Everything else is kind of an essay. This one is more like a little bit of a fable. It's called The Bunny and the Crocodile. One autumn morning, a little round bunny rabbit was hopping through the forest on her way to a bunny party. Nothing of note stood out to her about the day. The breeze was a little breezy. The leaves were a little leafy. The sky was a little skyy. Life in the forest was pretty boring most of the time. However, when it was dangerous, it was quite dangerous indeed. Therefore, she was certain to appreciate the quieter moments. The party she was heading to was at a friend's new hollow. 200 hops up the river and 100 hops to the left once she reached the blackberry bushes. Those were the directions she had been given. She was rounding hop 190 when she began to look out for the yummy blackberry bushes. The bunny had told herself she would stop for a break once she had reached them. After all, she would be more than halfway to her destination and entirely deserving of such a treat. Sure enough, up on the right, a huge patch of blackberry bushes lay right next to the riverbank. And on the left was the path to her friend's hollow. Merrily, she made her way to the bushes and began to eagerly nibble a bit greedily at the berries. She went through at least three blackberries before remembering to pay attention to her surroundings. By very number five, she was starting to slow down as her tummy filled with blackberry goodness. As she bit into the sixth berry, she noticed something very strange in the river. At first she thought it was a log. It was bumpy and big, seemingly drifting along, but definitely had eyes. They were big and yellow, with black slits for pupils like a snake's eyes. And it wasn't just drifting along now that she thought about it. It wasn't moving as quickly as the current. The bunny was intrigued. She'd never seen an animal like this in the forest before. She looked a bit scary, but in the water, until this point, he hadn't seemed to notice her, fat and happy in the blackberry bushes. The little brown bunny stared at the beast in awe. Knowing it wasn't wise to stay, she decided to continue on the path to her friend's new hollow. As she tried to back out of the bushes, she found her fur to be caught up in the brambles. She tried to keep calm and shake herself free, but the more she struggled, the tighter she felt. Without thinking, she bit down on one of the stems only to scrape her tongue on a thorn. With a squeal, she reared back and ripped herself out of the bushes, save for one paw. By this point, however, the animal in the water had noticed her. He had made his way ever so quickly, yet ever so quietly closer to the riverbank where the bunny was still somewhat trapped. Already panicked, she cried out and began to nod the bush wrapped around her paw. Her tiny heart was pounding in her chest. No matter how she nibbled or ripped, her foot would not come loose. Fear mounting, she looked into the river again, and there he was. His muzzle was submerged, but she could see it was long and lined with teeth. She'd never seen so many teeth in her whole life. And his eyes were so big, the biggest she had ever seen, and they were fixated on her. Her heart stopped pounding in her chest. It felt like it had stopped beating altogether, and she was frozen in terror and marvel. Time stood still. She was his, inevitably, she knew that. What chance did she have against him? She was a cute, tiny little thing, furry and soft, loving and eating. He was a perfect killing machine, silent and quick. Even now, inching ever so gracefully towards the bank, his movement was undetectable, yet he was definitely nearer. What power he emanated. Surely this creature didn't belong here, not in her forest. She would have seen or heard of such a beast. But now that the bunny could see him up close, she knew of what he was. With his dark yellow eyes, his hundreds of teeth, his claws, his scales, he was a real, live, genuine monster. To go out like this, she thought, was an honor and a curse. To be eaten by a beast sounded so grand, but who would be around to see it? Who would know to tell everyone of the water monster that ate the little brown bunny rabbit? Her ending with no audience, 
What's more, this was her grand finale. For the monster, she was just Sunday brunch. Another meal on another day. And that thought depressed her more than anything. Here he was, this giant, hulking spectacle of a creature. Anyone would be honored to be consumed by him. And she was a cute little brown rabbit, fat with blackberries and trapped in her own doing. The story of her life, and this is how it ended. And it did. In much less time than it takes to tell it. Faster than the blink of an eye, but for the bunny, it was a small eternity. In one smooth and effortless move, the monster had snatched her and the blackberry bush she was tangled in. She barely had time to gasp one last time before he crushed her spine in his teeth. It's a story about Vor. Vor. <laughs> if you're uh, not familiar, you can Google it, but I feel like you're you're a crowd who would get it. Vor. Vor. <laughs> get it. Get it. Get it. Get it. Yeah. For you, I was afraid.
It's my pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> so, I have been put in a very bad place when it came to thinking of what it was I should be looking for in another person. I'd come to accept at a point in my life that I wasn't going to find that because I wasn't gonna stand for less than what I knew I deserved or less than what I wanted. Yeah. So as part of my <laughs> Tumblr down essays, <laughs> uh, this was the last one that I did. It was Tumblr down essay number 10. This week, I'd like you to write about love. Are there soulmates? Is there a big leap from lust to love? What is the difference between lust and love to you? Do by Friday. <laughs> oh, love. What is there to write about love that hasn't already been written? I do enjoy this prompt, but it's the kind of enjoyment of a bad pun or a dad joke. It's yes. that... That feeling of rolling your eyes and actively trying to hide a smile because you do not want to encourage such behavior. It's true. Love is one of those things that the older I get and the more I experience it, the less I come away feeling like I understand it. It's interesting that you bring up lust too because both can cloud the mind and confuse you beyond explanation. I tend to believe that lust is more related to a carnal desire. Lust is a physical, sexual attraction, even an obsession. In many ways, I think that lust is passive. Lust is an uncultured, passionate yearning, primal and instinctive. Love is active. Love isn't just something that you feel, it's something that you do. It is beyond such an easy explanation. I think that love implies more effort than lust. To love someone is to actively care for their whole. It is not something one can really do well without trying. Love requires support, intimacy, knowledge. We may think ourselves capable of these things when we lust for someone, but when we love someone, those things become the forefront of our feelings. Support, I think, is the simplest of these to comprehend. What kind of support is necessary depends entirely on the people involved, but it is what sustains the concept of unconditional love. It implies a level of intimacy, or at least a strong desire for it. Intimacy, of course, comes in many forms, not just sexual intimacy. To give intimacy is to accept someone's vulnerability without giving consequence. It's creating space for safety from rejection or doubt. Knowledge in this context is more nuanced. We bring everything that we think we know about how the world works into our relationships. To love with knowledge is a testament to our compassion and capacity to deliver another human being from our own judgment. To love is to achieve an altruistic intent. I never thought I, of all people, would quote scripture let alone on a kink blog, but this is relevant. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongdoing. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. First Corinthians 13, 48. It's true. <laughs> this passage in the Bible talks about the many gifts God gives. The three biggest are faith, hope, and love. Quote, but the greatest of these is love. First Corinthians 13, 13. <laughs> Soulmates are another lofty idea, difficult to articulate. My answer to this question would be similar to questions about faith. In order to say whether or not I think something exists, we need to establish a clear definition. I certainly don't believe we all have one singular compatible human being with whom we can share true fairy tale love. I won't even go so far to say that that doesn't exist, but certainly the majority of romantic relationships do not fit into that category. 
I'll just remind you that there is no one-size-fits-all model for love or relationships, just as there isn't for life. There are at least as many ways to love in this world as there are ways to live in it. What makes a soulmate? How do you know when you've found them? Can we have multiple? Can we ever be happy again if we lose them? I'm not sure what I hope to achieve personally. For better or worse, I often find myself to be a love tourist. I fall fast and hard, but can fall back out very quickly. I try to spare people this experience by distancing myself, not usually for my own sake, but theirs. I've unintentionally used this method on people I was still very much in love with in the past to my own disastrous results. Love is one of many great art forms that frustrates me because of my inability to master it. Like guitar or sculpture or photography, I took all the classes, I read all the things, I memorized all the rules and the information, and I can explain it in theory, but in practice, however, my product is shoddy at best. I'm not sure if I'm incapable of picking suitable partners for the activity or if something that I'm contributing to it is defective, but I know that thus far at the time of this writing, I have been dissatisfied with the results of my efforts. Far be it from me to administer advice on it. Even in the movies I enjoy about love, there are rarely happy endings. In most of them, the couple breaks up or one of them ends up dying and the other one is back where they started. Alone again, but a changed person. Esther Perel is a Belgian psychotherapist who talks about how we measure success in relationships. We mistakenly believe that when relationships are over, particularly marriages ending in divorce, we have failed. Maybe we should define them by our growth as a person from beginning to end. Did the relationship change me fundamentally for the better? Did I learn more about who I am and what I am capable of? What direction did this send me in in regards to becoming the version of myself that I wish to be? If you answered positively to any of those questions, then maybe the length and the conclusion of the relationship don't really matter as much as you thought. I, I'm sorry? <laughs> before a lot of my writing was therapeutic and a lot of it helped me express ideas and change my own mind about how I felt about things. One of the things I was always caught up upon was sex and guilt. Now I didn't grow up really religious but I grew up in the south where everyone around me was super super religious so sex was something that was weaponized and something that was used to make me be afraid. So when I learned how to enjoy it, <laughs> which was great, there was a lot of guilt that started up with it. And I had to come up with my own problematic analogy to deal with that guilt. <laughs> uh, and I think that I did that uh, with one last essay for you guys. And I hope that you get where I'm going with it. I've spent the last year of my life trying to eliminate a lot of the shame that I've grown up with about my body, kinks, and just sex in general. I'd always been able to count on one hand the number of people that I had had sex with, which seemed like a really important quality to me. It wasn't until my last serious partner that I had experienced good sex consistently, and I was finally discovering what I enjoyed. And as it turned out, that was quite a lot. When we broke up, I found myself incredibly depressed. If I was being honest, it wasn't even about him as a person. A lot of it came from my sudden loss of sex and touch. As time went on, that became the bigger deficit in my life. I began seeing a narcissistic coworker, a terrible idea on all accounts. He was incredibly manipulative, but at the same time brought me a strange peace. It was soothing at times. I'm empathetic and he felt nothing. The sex was amazing and he helped me learn a lot about myself and my kinks and this was the first time having sex with someone regularly but not exclusively. 
With the epiphany of my freedom, I began to seek more sexual partners. Over the summer, I more than doubled the number of people I had slept with. I started asking myself, well, what counts as sex? And then I would lose count and start feeling guilty and ashamed because I thought this number was supposed to be important. Somehow this number factored into my overall decency as a human being, especially as a woman. I needed to think of a good analogy for the number of sex partners I had in order to adjust my feelings. And it took quite some time, but I think I found it, so stick with me. I remember the first car that I ever drove. It was my sister's 1985 Pepsi can metallic blue Chrysler Plymouth, which they don't even make anymore. We called it the POS, which stood for piece of shit. It broke down a lot, and my brother and I would get out and push as my sister steered it back home. We kept a baseball bat shoved into the crease in the back seat between the back and the butt cushions of the driver's seat because the head kept falling backwards, so, the, so it was there to prop it up. I was 12, and my family let me drive the car in laps around the house. It was tricky at the back corner where my mother's bedroom was because the neighbor's fence jutted out and made another corner diagonally, and that car was just narrow enough to fit through. I would allow myself just the slightest bit of speed in the backyard, flying around the house, and slow down to fit between the corner and the fence. Eventually, the POS broke down beyond repair, and my sister was away at college anyway. Towards the end of college, I got my very first car. It was a black 2007 Nissan Versa hatchback. I bought pink and black seat covers, and I coddled that baby. I drove it back and forth across North Carolina, the coast to the mountains. It had GPS and a DVD player and all sorts of other shit that I did not use. But more than anything, it was mine. That was what I loved about it more than anything. I had moved to New York at the beginning of 2011. I came up in the Versa with all of my stuff and the plan was for my mom to come and get it and take it back home so that my sister could use it while I lived in the city. I had it with me in Brooklyn for months and the only time I drove it was to move it for street cleaning. I kind of started to resent it. It had become a nuisance in this new place. I had a friend visiting one week and we were leaving to catch the subway into the city before a show. I decided to move the car before we left so I wouldn't have to do it in the morning. As I approached, I noticed there was no glare on the passenger side window. That's weird. I thought, did I leave the window down? My stomach dropped when I ran up to see that the window was smashed and the stereo was stolen. I sobbed in anger and mourning. I had been invaded. Something important to me was damaged. My friend calmed me down and helped me move the car and convinced me to go to the show and deal with the car in the morning. In the morning, we cleaned up the glass, bandaged up the window, and took it to get repaired. I never replaced the stereo. My mom came up to take it home a few weeks later. My sister had it for a few months, and after parking it illegally too many times, it was impounded. When she never went to pick it up, it was taken by the state. And just like that, my very first car, my love, was gone. For Christmas of 2017, one of my best friends gifted me her 2005 Dodge Stratus. She was purchasing a new car and the trade-in value was not worth the effort to get it to the dealership. For the price of the title and the transfer change, it was mine. I drove its little heart out. I named it Spike because our relationship was as fraught as Buffy's with the blonde British vampire. Woo! Yes. <laughs> fraught. Fraught. The driver's side window and the horn didn't work. It did, however, reduce my two hour septa commute, because I live in Philly now and that's their MTA, and it's also terrible, to 45 minutes. I drove it with one headlight for weeks, just turning the brights on to make the streets in the city visible. It got me back and forth for months of rehearsals and a summer of headwake performances. Spike died on July 3rd, 2018, on my way to work. I rebounded quickly with the help of my bank. I bought Drusilla the next day. <laughs> You're not a Buffy fan. Drusilla is Spike's girlfriend from Buffy. <laughs> She's a 2014 Ford Focus. It is not a model I ever would have seen myself with in the past, but she was there when I needed her. I am so grateful for her. 
Now that we're together, I don't know what I'd do without her. Sure, I got her used, but with less than 25,000 miles on her, age is really nothing but a number. <laughs> when I was a little kid, I know I sat behind the wheel of a car once or twice, but nothing happened. I know in my teens, my family tried to teach me how to drive stick in my brother's car, and that never took off. I always got anxious about timing the clutch just right, and I would stall out. I just couldn't make it up. I have driven dozens of rental cars, some for a few hours, some for weeks. Sometimes friends have been kind enough to lend me their cars or to give me a ride when I needed to go somewhere. Just about everyone interacts with cars at some point in their lives. A lot of people drive every day. You can't go anywhere without seeing cars. Sometimes they're in ads for no reason, selling something that has absolutely nothing to do with cars. Some people make their whole lives about cars. They collect them, they modify them, they race them, they make it their hobby. Some people even make it their job. Some people hate cars and never want to drive them or even ride in them. Some people start driving early, some people start driving late. Some people never even try it. Some people take every precaution and some people are a little less safe. What I think we can all agree on is this. The number of cars a person has driven in their life says absolutely nothing about their worth as a human being. The number of sexual partners a person has in their life says absolutely nothing about their worth as a human being. I left the job with a narcissistic coworker and we stopped speaking. I took a new job, I got cast in one of my dream roles, I got some incredible artistic opportunities, and I met the love of my life. I like to make jokes that most of my writing is about my conquests. The reality is that it helps me dissuade some guilt I feel about enjoying sex. I write about it so that my sex is a part of my art. I also love driving, though it may not be as big a part of my life. I have a lot of stories and memories around my experiences with it. Neither of these things will tell you much about me or who I am. If you ask me or anyone who knows me to describe me, I don't think either topic would come up very quickly in conversation. Even if it did, it wouldn't matter. Sex, driving, performing, writing, food, film, theater, podcasting, magic, cooking, yoga, reading, these are all things that I enjoy and not one of them defines my worth. I think the world would be a little bit nicer if we reminded each other of that. So here I am reminding myself. This song doesn't have any music. <laughs> it's not supposed to. Oh Lord, won't you buy me? A Mercedes Benz. My friends all drive Porsches. I must make amends. Worked hard all my lifetime. No help from my friends. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Oh Lord, won't you buy me a color TV? Dialing for dollars is trying to find me. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a color TV? Oh Lord, won't you buy me a night on the town? Counting on you, Lord, please don't let me down. Prove that you love me and I'm the next one. Oh Lord, won't you buy me a night on the town? Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes? Thank you. <laughs>
I really want to take the time to thank all of you for watching a little preview of my show tonight. Um, thank you. Uh, all of the songs, which I have, this is like a little short version of it. But if you haven't noticed, they're all by members of what's called the 27 Club. Yeah. Yeah. These are all, thank you. These are all famous musicians who died at the age of 27. Uh, Amy Winehouse, we had Jim Morrison of The Doors, uh, that was Janis Joplin. So with that, uh, I have one more confirmed song and then just one more if you're like feeling it. Uh, <laughs> so I hope you liked the show. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, and if you didn't, this song is for you. Welcome to the land of fame excess. 
am I gonna fit in? Jumped in the cab, here I am for the first time. Look to my right and I see the Hollywood sign. This is all so crazy. Everybody seems so famous. My tummy's turning and I'm feeling kind of homesick. Too much pressure and I'm nervous. That's when the taxi man turned on the radio and the Jay-Z song was on. And the Jay-Z song was on. And the Jay-Z song was on. Put my hands up, they're playing my song. The butterflies fly away. Not in my head like, yeah. Moving my hips like, yeah. I got my hands up, they're playing my song. And all the club in the taxi cab, everybody looking at me now. Like, who's that chick that's rocking kicks? She's gotta be from out of town. It's so hard when my girl's not around me. It's definitely not a Nashville party. Cause all I see is stilettos. I guess I never got the memo. My tummy's turning and I'm feeling kinda homesick. Too much pressure and I'm nervous. That's when the DJ dropped my favorite tune and a Britney song's on. And a Britney song was on, and a Britney song was on. Oh, baby, baby, how was I supposed to know? Hands up, play my song, mother's fly away. Not in my head, like, yeah. Moving my hips like, yeah. I got my hands up, they're playing my song. I know I wanna be okay. Yeah, it's a party in the USA. Oh, yeah, it's a party in the USA. Oh, hands up, they're playing my song. The butterflies fly away. Not in my head like, yeah. Moving my hips like, yeah. I got my hands up, they're playing my song. I know I wanna be okay. Yeah, it's a party in the USA. Oh yeah, oh oh, it's a party in the USA. Thank you so much. I'm Stephanie C. Harrison. This has been Bad Sex and Other Problematic Analogies.